We've heard a lot of talk in this last, actually a couple years, about carbon credits and carbon credit programs, environmental credit programs. <clears throat> and uh, we've invited Anna Tweet Tweeter to come this morning. Anna's with Cargill, and she's going to talk with us about their regenerative program. And carbon credits are in part of that <clears throat> as well. Um, Anna's a Wisconsin native. We're glad you came to Minnesota. And she's fairly new to Cargill and fairly new to this program, so I'm interested to hear what you're doing. Anna, you may prefer this mic. Yeah, I think I might. Um, now it should be on. All right, can you Thanks, hear me? Anna. We're good? All right. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, before I get into everything, I'm curious to see how many of you have been approached by any sort of carbon program at this point. Bayer, Truterra, whoever. So not many of you. I think that that's a really great opportunity for all of you to learn a little bit more. Um, and hopefully I can do that. I know that there's a lot of mystery around carbon markets and where does it go? Where does it come from? How does it work? And so part of my intention today is to be more educational, more educational and less uh, sales pitch, if you will. Um, and so I'd really like to walk through how a lot of this works, and then I'll talk about our program as well, just to be uh, as a, an example of what you can compare to. So as uh, Margaret mentioned, there's a lot of companies making a lot of claims about carbon, greenhouse gas emissions, a lot of, of uh, intentions being set. And so how do they plan on doing that? A lot of them think that uh, ag-based carbon credits are the way to the future for them. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about kind of how that process works for them and, and where we're at. So you can see here a ton of different companies have talked about um, going net zero by 2050. Um, some of them Cargill is related to in terms of our supply chain. Some of them are completely separate, such as uh, Amazon or Microsoft, some of these really big name companies who've made a lot of really big commitments. And so. Um, as these promises get made, they have to fulfill them, uh, and that means involving some of the uh, farmers that are in this room, hopefully. Um, and I think this really shows that there is a, it's not a fad, carbon, carbon markets hopefully aren't just here for the next couple of years, but in instead is a long-term mindset and I think a, a long-term future potential uh, diverse market for all of you. So as I talked about, these are some of the really big companies uh, using science-based target initiatives. And what this means is they're using science-based uh, measurements for greenhouse gases to uh, measure and compare against in terms of their supply chain commitments. Um, so we see some really big ones, General Mills, Coca-Cola, Cargill were on there, uh, McDonald's, Walmart, et cetera. And I think Thinking about the amount of impact that these types of companies have and how far reaching they are, that's, that says a lot about the, the seriousness that these companies are with carbon and carbon markets. Yeah, question? Yeah, 31% reduction in intensity in the greenhouse gases that they're. That's their goal. Yep. And you know, every company is deciding the, these elements on their own, so it's really dependent on the company's intentions, and that's why there's a lot of different values, and I think they determine a lot of these things based on where they think they have impact and control in their supply chains. So that's why none of them are all 50% or something like that. So why now? I think a lot of you are familiar with the conversation around climate change or at least these really intense changes in weather that we've seen, the drought we had this year, the really intense three, four, five inch rainfalls that some of us have seen. Um, on top of that, we have consumers on the other end of the supply chain who are really concerned about sustainability and where their food comes from, right? You know, these consumers haven't really been this concerned about their food as they are right now. And so that's a definitely a driving factor, especially for a lot of these companies that produce products. Um, and of course, there's commitments for sustainability and reducing emissions from these companies internally as well, and so they have their own personal goals that they want to make. Um, but the combination of all of these things, I think, helps 
really push this forward like it hasn't been before. And so as, as a lot of what I've alluded to, agriculture is how we will address climate change, protect our land and water, and sustainably feed our growing population. Um, there is no alternative to producing feed, fuel, and fiber, so what we're doing with the soil and what we want to do with the soil is what we need to do now. Um, and if we want to see those changes, we know we need to incentivize farmers to do so. It's expensive to implement these practices, and we're asking a lot from you, so why not pay you to do it, right? We want to make sure that if we want to see the results, we want to get them done and get them done right. And so there's been this race to the farm gate. And like I mentioned before, most of you haven't uh, been contacted by these companies, but uh, a lot of the farmers that I have talked to have talked to either Bayer or Indigo. Those are usually the two I hear from the most. There's also Corteva, there's Truterra, Nutrien, Nori, um, and then Cargill. <laughs> there's a lot of programs, <laughs> and I recognize that. And so I'm hoping that I can add some clarity around our program, uh, as well as give you some food for thought in terms of what you should be looking for if somebody approaches you and said, hey, uh, Mr. Farmer, I think you should sign up for this. And you go, well, here are some questions that I need to ask you before I make any sort of commitments. And so I, I really want you to take those pieces away and not necessarily say, Cargill's the best program for me. I really want you to find what's best for you. And so first I want to talk about the basics of carbon sequestration. Uh, we know it's plants capturing capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and storing it in root biomass, root exudates in the soil, as well as plant biomass on top of the soil. All of that gets brought down into the soil, helps the microbes turn over and mineralize uh, nutrients, and is captured in the soil uh, for long-term benefit, right? And so the... Um, organic matter that it's brought into the soil, we need it to stay there. That's where a lot of these companies are concerned about using ag as a major focus for carbon sequestration, and so that's where some of the practices that you may have heard of, reduced till, no-till, really come into play. But when we're talking about uh, carbon sequestration, you usually can see 0.5 or 0.3 0.3 to 0.5 metric tons of carbon per year captured when you implement conservation practices. So keep those numbers in mind. But the uh, carbon market currently is very liquid, and so a lot of the companies who are bringing this to your attention are setting the base rate because there's nobody that's really been able to say, this is the authority, this is who's setting the price for these markets, and so we are all taking our best guess at the initial value of carbon, mark, uh, carbon credits initially, but I think as they take off, it'll become more liquid like we see with corn and beans. And so here's a more detailed description of soil carbon sequestration. As I mentioned before, regenerative practices help to encourage more carbon into the soil and then keep it there. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of other benefits besides just carbon when we do these practices. If a lot of you have heard about soil health and how that benefits the farmer, it creates resiliency, it improves uh, um, reactions to drought, it, it uh, increases um, water holding capacity, infiltration, increases mineralization. So there's all these other benefits be besides just carbon. Um, that come with implementing uh, these practices. And so I want to I set some defining language first before I really get into how the, the process and the flow of the market is. First, what is a carbon credit, right? This is our base unit. It is the removal or reduction of one ton of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we've taken that from the atmosphere and now we've stored it into the soil. That is the unit that we are measuring and accounting for when looking at these, these practices in, in the market. Permanence, that's a really big one that you hear a lot. Um, while there is no perfect or strict definition, oh, do you want me to answer a question? So the, uh, the question is, how do you weigh carbon? Um, carbon? Carbon gas still has a density. 
Um, and as it is converted from the atmosphere, that density, into the soil, that's what is being measured. Does that answer your question? So carbon dioxide does have a weight. Even air has a weight. This is, this is much more uh, general chemistry than it is agronomy, so I'll do my best to explain it. But Yes. So carbon, carbon as a molecule still has a weight, even if you don't feel it. that help? Otherwise, we can definitely talk about it afterwards, too. Yeah? Okay. So, permanence. CO2 that is captured and stays in the soil for a long time. So these registries, these groups that really want carbon to be stored in the soil, want to make sure that they can account for it over a lifetime, whether that's 30 years, that's 100 years, they want the carbon to stay in the soil so they know that these improvements actually have impact on the greenhouse gases that are being emitted and taken back into the soil and are staying there. And so that's why you see a lot of these companies have really long-term contracts because it's the easiest way to guarantee permanence. Um, then there's additionality, and this, uh, this is bringing the new practices to the farm. And what that means is you have to add a practice to be able to participate in most of these programs because the companies who are paying for the credits want to actually accurately account for their efforts. That's a really, really challenging thing, especially in a room like this where I'm sure a lot of you already do some of these practices. And so I want to touch on that now before it, it, it comes up as a question later of the farmers who have been doing the practices for a long time. Uh, I recognize and hear all of those farmers, and I know that they want to be recognized as well. And so I, we, as an industry, are working to find a solution. But right now, there's no downstream customers who say, well, they did it in the past, so I'm going to pay them for doing something that I had no influence on. And so I know that that's a, a very frustrating place to be, but I, I just want to assure you that we are working as hard as we can to find a solution. Um, some of that may end up being uh, like a legacy carbon program or a carbon bank with the USDA or some other alternative besides private industry. Any questions on these terms? So how are carbon credits quantified, right? It all kind of seems like magic when I first talk about it. Um, there are a couple of different ways. There's direct measurement. You know, somebody goes out there with a soil probe, takes it back to the lab, measures how much soil carbon is available in that, in that sample um, done across on a huge scale. There's modeling. Um, for example, Bayer, they have developed their own model that they reference for carbon crediting. Uh, and then there's modeling and sensing, which uses satellites that measures, um, so there's Optus, which is a satellite that looks at um, uh, tillage uh, residue left on the soil surface, as well as looking at greenery found on the soil surface. Uh, so when somebody talks about NDRE or NDVI, that's those green metrics, that's what they're measuring. At Cargill, we uh, reference the DNDC model, that's the denitrification and decomposition model. It's an old model that's been really well studied, takes in over 200 different metrics. Um, and that's what produces the calculation of how much carbon a farmer may be sequestering. In addition to that, we also do direct measurements. We sent out crews this fall to do soil sampling so that we know that what the model is saying is accurate and well informed. Um, not every company who is involved in these carbon credit um, activities do all three of these things. So I want to throw that out there as when somebody approaches you and says, hey, I'm interested in, in getting you to sign up for carbon, how do they measure it? What are they, what are they defining as a carbon credit and how do they quantify it? That's a really big question to ask. So this just came out at the beginning of November. It's by Iowa State. 
Uh, it's A177 is the document if you want to refer back to it. They go really in depth. It's a great article and I think it's a really good reference. Uh, you should be able to find it online pretty quickly. But they have this general breakdown of traditional carbon offset generation and I think that's a really helpful example. So I'm going to walk through it because a lot of the times it's kind of confusing who goes where, why, when, where does the data go, where does the money go, and so I want to make sure that we understand some of this, so I'm going to walk through it. Obviously we have our farmers back here, that's all of you. You work with the, and I don't know why there's a text box there, but the, the, the carbon groups, so such as Cargill, Bayer, Corteva, are in this box here. And they are the ones that are starting to develop the methods, uh, they design the project, so that's part of what my team does. We work with the farmers going this way to explain what we need the farmers to do, and then the money that comes from selling the credits comes to you, right? What you guys do then is implement those practices, and that data comes to us. Us meaning Cargill or Bayer or whoever you might have signed up with, right? From there, that data will go to a verifier. For us, that's Regrow. That's our platform that we use. They're the ones who help us calculate um, how much carbon was actually sequestered or captured using, again, soil, samples, satellite, and model. They take that data, and it's all protected between the groups so they can't identify farmer, you know, this is farmer A's information and we're going to send it to these groups all the way over here and you know then I'm going to come back to you farmer A and give you a big fine. That's, that's not how that works. Um, but they, the verifiers then give that information in terms of how much was acquired, not per field, but the total amount goes to the standards to make sure that the standard who we as the company have to follow to make sure that they can verify the carbon credits that we're working with. They gave us a big thumbs up or a thumbs down, depending on how it worked. Um, and so then we can say, okay, we have this carbon credit, it's been verified, it's been validated by the registries, now we say, okay, downstream customer, McDonald's, Pepsi, Microsoft, whoever. We have this carbon credit right here, it's all, all packaged up and nice for you, and we've verified it, and we've paid the farmer, pay us you know, however much for this carbon credit. And so that's kind of that, the process overall, um, and I really wanna make sure that that's clear because I think a lot of times it's confusing to know who goes where and when. Do I have any questions about that? Yeah. Sure. So um, we as Cargill work with our verifier who is Regrow, and that is a field-by-field -field basis. So it is really well detailed, but that data in terms of like the personal information of like your farm, all of that is privatized so that it doesn't, it, that information only flows between the two of us. The private information doesn't go towards the register. Does that help? Any other questions? I get this question a lot, can farmers register credits? And my answer is going to be that of technically you probably could. Is it going to be worth your time, money, and effort? Absolutely not. Um, as I explained in that previous process, you have to go through those, all of those steps to be able to get a carbon credit that you could sell, and then you have to have somebody who's willing to set out a deal with you and you have to sell it to them. I think in the future that farmers might be able to do this, but we are not at the point where farmers can enter and kind of take out that middleman because there are so many pieces involved right now um, for farmers. But what that means is Cargill takes on the risk of selling the credits. We ask you to do these practices, we pay you, we take on the risk of dealing with the credits so that you don't have to. Um, there's currently not one standard, but we are working towards creating a standard, not we as in cargo, but we as an industry, are creating a, a standard or a, a couple standards that are followed between groups, between industries, 
so that we can actually be comparing apples to apples. Uh, we don't want to say, well, here's standard one and standard 10, and they don't measure the same thing at all. We want to make sure that they are all within the same realm so that we can actually sell between different industries. Absolutely. Um, I think in the future that that will be the case. Um, right now, we don't have anything that we can publicly announce uh, just because these deals are so new that, um, so new and not yet confirmed. Um, I do think that there will be transparency around what they're selling it for um, and what Cargill makes and what the farmer makes. Um, currently, Cargill is not taking anything from, from the sales of credits. I want to make that clear because we want to make sure that the standard or the, uh, the market is actually established first. Um, and so we need a lot of participation to do that first. Right, so why is Cargill here? We want to be the bridge between the farmer and the down end user, downstream user. Um, we believe in providing an opportunity for farmers to participate in a new market. I know we hear that all the time that, you know, all, you, all, all you're able to do is sell corn and soybeans. Where, where are the other options, right? Um, and so we want to make sure that there are other opportunities. One, so that we make those improvements to our environment, to soil health, but as well as to the farmer livelihood. Um, just to give you an idea of scale and talk a little bit more about Cargill and our program. We are a really big company. Most of you know that. Uh, we work in 70 different countries. Um, we've been around for a really long time. But we are really well connected between farmers and those other, other downstream users like McDonald's, like Pepsi, like Unilever, you name it. If it's in the, the food supply chain, we, we're connected to them, which is a very different perspective than a lot of these other companies that have come uh, along to try and get into the carbon market game. Um, and I think that that sets us up for success because we already have those relationships and much more guarantee in terms of working out and negotiating deals with some of these other companies. Yeah. Yes, there is still Cargill family involved in the higher rankings of the <laughs> Cargill leadership. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But yeah. Um, again, uh, just as a, a example, you know, we're providing insights. I mean, if any of you have worked with Cargill, you know we have a suite of solutions in terms of grain marketing. Um, we believe that the carbon market is just another option for uh, uh, providing insights and opportunity for farmers. We transform a lot of, of uh, raw goods. So, you know, we have, um, we uh, work with starches and sweeteners and create uh, soybean meal. We do all of those things to sell to other companies. We transport all of these goods. So there's a lot of different areas that Cargill touches that provide opportunity for us and you. Um, talked about portfolio programs. Um, in other states, we do have other programs. Oh, question, sorry. Yep. So the question is, growers who have already been doing these practices, why do they, why are they not able to participate? That's, um, and I touched on that a little bit, that there are, unfortunately, it's all directed by the downstream customers and what they're willing to pay for. And I wish I could go to Pepsi and McDonald's and all of them and be like, hey, you need to pay these farmers who have been doing the right thing. 
um, but they aren't interested in doing that right now. Um, I will say that the, with how our program is set up, I do not recommend any farmers to go and dig and till and you know, ruin the progress that they have made because it's ultimately not going to benefit them enough to make it worth doing it in terms of the money you'd be making from the program. You're, you're going to end up hurting yourself more than helping yourself by reversing what you've been doing for a long period of time. Does that answer your question? I'm not either. <laughs> carbon bank. Yeah, yeah there, there's legislation in the works and conversations in government, and this is not my area of expertise, so I'm, I take with what I say with a grain of salt, but we are encouraging them to consider a carbon bank to reward the farmers who have been doing it right, because we recognize that there is a need for that. So I, I want to put that out there, that we want to make sure those farmers who have been doing it right do get recognized, but also realize that there are, are so many farmers who don't do these practices that there is still an op It's more encouraging for those downstream customers to focus on them. Another question? Yeah, it's it's frustrating. Um, I, we had a question back. You ex, okay? We had a question back there, Matt, and then I'll come up here front. Yeah, so the question is, is there regionality and focus in different regions for the types of soils and potential for these programs? Um, I haven't actually got a chance to talk about where we're at yet, um, but to an answer your question, yes and no. <laughs> um, a lot of it is about the opportunity of potential carbon to be gathered in the soil, um, whether that's really, really depleted soils that have been beat up for a long time and they have really low organic, uh, organic carbon in the soil, you know, we can definitely focus on those farmers. And of course, there's the natural gradation of organic matter throughout the United States. You know, the South has really low levels of organic matter. But also you have to consider that that, that organic carbon cycles a lot faster, so it takes more work to get that carbon to stay. So it's really dependent on weather, temperature, on practices, on commodity. Um, but right now, we're focusing on the Midwest. And that's where most, most companies are focusing. But there is more outreach into other commodities as we speak. And then a question up here. They meaning the companies I'm referring to, or just in general? So the question is, how long have we been talking about carbon credits? And I believe that the early 2000s, there was a really big push for carbon credits. Um, I was significantly younger, so I can't recount my, uh, <laughs> that, that time for myself. But um, there was a big push for carbon credits earlier. Um, I don't think there was the same buy-in from private industry that there is now. A lot of that was much more trapping, uh, uh, cap and trade like there is in California, and it's much, it was much more government regulated, which was obviously not a very appealing thing for a lot of people, um, which is why now with these voluntary markets, there's a ton more excitement because one, you know, we don't need more regulation for farmers. We want you to show and demonstrate that you're interested in doing the right thing, and so I think that's where a lot of energy is coming from. That that is not what they. Because we're doing good, what do they do with that? They can offset their pollution, right? 
Yes. So how that works is, right, you guys are doing good. We pay you and reward you to do that. There are things that we need in our supply chain and transportation chains where we cannot reduce the amount of greenhouse gases produced to make the supply chain function at all. Right? And I'm not, I'm not talking about some of these industries that are major, major polluters outside of the supply chain or our ag supply chain right now, but even just transporting the grain to China where you want to sell that grain, right? There are still greenhouse gases associated with that that we can't get rid of. And so that's where a lot of, at least Cargill's intention is focused right now. So. So that's where the, so those standards come in that I was talking about. Right, the, the standards that I, that I talked about, they're the ones that are saying how we're accounting for those, because they're third party. They have nothing to do with Cargill, they have nothing to do with Bayer. They're the ones that are saying, okay, you have this credit, this is what you've done with it, you've done the proper accounting, and you've used it appropriately. So it's not, it's not completely uh, willy-nilly where we just go, ah, we're just gonna pollute more. Like that's, one, Cargill already has its own sustainability goals where we're trying to reduce as much as we can to begin with, but in those areas where we can't do that, like I talked about in the supply chain, that's where these, these farmer efforts, I think, can make a really big impact. Any other questions or I'll keep going? So I will talk about that in just a second because I do think what Cargill does accounts for that better than some other programs. So why regenerative ag? I'm gonna to touch on this and then I'll get into the program, the dirty details, the stuff that I know you guys really want to, uh, to uh, compare notes with. Um, I don't think these numbers are, are shocking to a lot of you, but there is uh, research by the Soil Health Institute that talks about the impact that soil health practices have on farm. Um, and they worked with 100 farmers in like seven or eight states, so it was a pretty widespread study. 97% um, reported increased uh, crop resilience to extreme weather. I've already talked about that. In, intense drought, intense rainfall, there's uh, more resilience, better, better yields uh, when using these practices. Um, increased net income, um, higher yield than conventional systems. Now I think that depends on where you live and how long you've been doing it. Um, I think that has a huge impact on it um, and we can definitely talk more about that. Um, and then reducing average cost to grow di uh, corn and beans uh, by $17 an acre and $45 an acre. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to bring that up as a uh, not only is carbon a benefit, but these other, these other pieces as well. Uh, we talked about soil health quite a bit. Okay, Cargill Regen Connect. That's the carbon program that I'm here representing. I am not trying to sell it to you, I promise. But if you think it's a good fit, then I think we can talk. Uh, last year, or 2021, so this, this year into next spring, um, these are the states that we're currently in. Um, I want to say that we are working currently on expanding, and I think Minnesota is definitely in our sight line. We won't be able to announce what states we're in until next, this coming spring. Um, but keep an eye out for that. I, I do think Minnesota has a lot of potential, so I want to say that first and foremost. Um, so Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee are all the states we focused on. Um, you have to be a Cargill customer at this point. It makes it a lot easier for us to keep track of a lot of these things. Um, practices, cover crops, no-till and reduced tillage. We are not particularly 
picky when it comes to how you implement these things as long as you do them, because we're really just measuring the amount of carbon captured. So uh, I know there are other programs that are pretty strict with some of these things about how and when exactly you do it, um, but we try to be as farmer-friendly farmer as we can be. And then payment for the uh, net carbon sequestered. So generally speaking, it's about $20 a metric ton uh, of carbon is the going rate, and that's between most of these programs. Um, I mean, I've seen variations anywhere from 5 to $40, but that $40 is for programs that also include water. Um, we, uh, as Cargill, measure based on per metric ton, not per practice. And the reason for that is it makes it significantly easier to properly pay you guys, as well as make sure that we are crediting the way that we need to, to have valid carbon credits. Um, typically, what you'll see is about 0.3 to 0.5 metric tons per acre, um, all the way up to 0.8, depending on you know, the conditions of your soil, where you live, what practices you're implementing. Um, that can be anywhere from seven to about $15 an acre, uh, depending on, again, those practices, where you live, what you've done. Um, this enrollment period for last year was June through September. Um, I think next year we will be open uh, earlier so that growers can more accurately figure out what they need. And what I mean by that is uh, we're not having growers sign up in September and then scrambling to find cover crop seed. We recognize with the potential shortages of small grains um, and other cover crops that it can be difficult to find things that late in the year. And so we want to make sure that we are leaving time and room for that. And then again, we are partnering with Regrow, Practical Farmers of Iowa, and Farm Raise. Um, Practical Farmers of Iowa is here as a resource as well as myself. Um, Regrow is the platform that we work with. They're that third-party verifier who we have a very, very strict uh, security data transfer policy with, where the farmer goes, puts in five years of past practices, you have to have not done the practice in the last year. Take that information, you have all of your fields that you're planning on uh, working with, you say, okay, on these fields I'm gonna do reduced till, these fields I'm gonna do no-till, these fields I'm going to do cover crops, and you can combine uh, those practices as well. Uh, it'll spit out a calculator to tell you how much carbon that you're capturing. So you actually get to see an estimate of how much carbon you're going to be capturing and what your payment looks like. Um, we then take that information, say, okay, Mr. Farmer, here's, here is the uh, contract that you're going to sign. Here's how much you're going to get paid. Um, and then go through the next growing year, take the soil samples that we'll collect in the next growing year, take the satellite information that we've collected, and how much biomass growth we've seen from the cover crops, how much residue was left on the surface, uh, take all that into account, come back on the back end, reconfirm how much carbon was actually sequestered, um, and then pay the farmer. Um, we do it a little differently than others. We do a split payment. So the first payment comes after you've signed the contract and you have a estimate of how much carbon you're going to be receiving. Um, that is so you have funds to do the practices you need to do. Um, I know that there are some programs that <laughs> will take a long time to get you your money and we recognize that that's not very practical for uh, using or implementing the practices you actually need to do. Um, so we split payment, we do it in the, um, the winter of the first year, and then at the end of the, after the end of the growing season for the next year, do the rest of the payment. Anybody who delivers grain to Cargill, Oh, let me, yeah, let me re uh, ask the question. Who would be considered a Cargill customer? Anybody who has an account number with Cargill and delivers grain to our elevators? Yeah. 
No, there, there is no qualification in terms of amount of grain delivered or frequency. As long as you were, are a customer and have delivered grain to us at some point, uh, you are, are eligible. That's, that sounds flexible then. Yes. Yep. That is our, our goal. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. One more question, Anna. Sure. So you um, obviously want to make this as simple as possible. So on the right side, you have the practices that you allow cover crops and mm -hmm. no-till and reduced tillage. But you also said you're pretty, uh, Cargill is pretty open uh, to different practices. So inside cover crops, are you including practices like relay cropping or winter grains or other things like that? Yes. Okay. I think the way to think about it is the satellite isn't going to be looking down and being like, this is the practice you did. What it's looking at is I see greenness and I see residue. That's mm -hmm. what it's measuring. And so that's how I really encourage growers to think about it is how long is that satellite going to be measuring greenness on the field? Right. Okay. That's good to know because when it says cover crops, some people in their head automatically think, okay, well, I'm going to terminate that. So maybe my winter Winter wheat yes. doesn't qualify or whatever, when in fact it would. We, we do have growers who are growing winter wheat, but I also want to make sure that you, you don't want to just do it for winter wheat and then not implement either a, a double crop like with soybeans or with a uh, cover crop after that. Maybe you want to get out there and graze that cover crop after you harvest wheat, you know, whatever it is. Like I said, we're flexible. We just want to see green on the field as long as possible. Um, one last thing that I did not mention is our program is a one-year contract. The reason that we do that is we really want to make sure that farmers feel comfortable with what they're doing. And what that means is if you, say you pick up a new piece of land and you're trying out a new process, okay, well, you've tried it out, you realize this, this piece of land has a lot of work left to do and you really don't have the time or energy to do it, you, you know, you're able to to back out the next year and not have to do it. Um, now granted, that puts us at a risk, so what we're doing is really making sure that you have the uh, resources from us to be able to continue to re-enroll every year to make sure that we can talk to those downstream customers and say, hey, 85% of our customers are re-enrolling, so we do have permanence in our system and we can count on those farmers enrolling and they don't need to be tied into a 20-year contract. The other piece that that brings then is when the price starts to go up, we can actually give you market rate rather than locking you in at $20 an acre for 20 years. You know, if it goes up to $60, $60 per metric ton or something, we're able to then reflect that back in our contract with you. And I think ultimately that's a benefit for the farmer um, so that we aren't, you know, capturing the difference of that $40 per, met per metric ton, right? We want to make sure that you guys are successful. So that's, that's I think, one of the last pieces that I want to mention about the program. Um, partners, I already talked about. Question? Uh, you said look down on green satellites. Yep. What about residue? Residue is another piece of that. How, does satellites pick that up too? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. The future of ag-based carbon credits. Um, this is just a, a summary of what, what we're seeing uh, in the industry. Um, a 15 times increase by 2030. It has the potential to be between 5 billion and 180 billion by 2030, depending on the, uh, the buyer um, and, and signals given by those other industries that I keep referring to. And again, I feel we're advantaged to be in this market because of the relationships and the tie to both ends of the supply chain that we already already are working with. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that this is this presentation is exciting and potentially an opportunity um, and something to consider uh, when we are able to be in Minnesota. Um, I will leave my contact information up there even if you aren't signed up I'm more than happy to answer questions later. If you want to talk to me about other programs and don't have anybody else to talk to, I'm more than happy to do that. And I don't mean that as a, hey, I'll sell you on Cargill, uh, but as a, here are the things you should think about. You know, I've seen a lot of um, 
magazine articles putting out the six red flags of carbon programs uh, that you need to pay attention to, like if they discourage you to talk to your lawyer or, or whatever, I don't remember what they say in them. Usually when I read them, I agree with them. You need to be careful. You need to look at what you're doing. We encourage our growers who are signing up to talk with their lawyer and look through their, our contracts. So we are not trying to pull the wool over your eyes. We're trying to be as transparent as possible and give you an opportunity into a new market. So yeah, here's my, uh, our website, cargill.regrow.ag. Um, check it out. I think it's pretty cool. That's, I'm a little biased, but um, there's my contact information if you want to reach out. Uh, any other questions? Anna, could you go back to the last slide about the future? Yeah. So, so a science question rather than a business-based question is, mm -hmm. at some point, we, we are going to reach a max, and there's a returning amount of carbon that yes. our soils can hold. What happens then? Uh, we may be a long way from that, but there's a diminishing return once you start to uh, increase your organic matter. Um, yes, that is definitely something it, it, that is, I think, a, a, a valid concern. Um, one, I think it'll take a long time to actually hit that point. I mean, I've seen reports as long as 30 years, which in a, the lifetime of a farmer is a long time. Um, for us, we are a global business, and so there are a lot of other places and opportunities in other countries that we can also implement a similar program, I think. Um, and I think we will probably continue to to push the envelope in terms of how we can get as much carbon stored in the soils as possible. But I, I, I understand your concern. <laughs> is this just for farmers? Maybe repeat the question. Yeah, is, is this program for everybody or is it just for farmers? Right now mm -hmm. it is just for farmers, at least our program. Um, I know there are other efforts in other industries, such as forestry, where they, I know they are working on doing something similar. Um, I think there's potential in a whole, whole sea of different carbon sinks that we can, we can look at. And as the soil gets better, mm -hmm. they measure every Um, the rate of carbon sequestration is, it, it, it is a, yeah, as we talked about, it kind of does this. So the rate you'll see will be fairly steady for a long time until the soil reaches its like maximum capacity. But there is a lot of research talking about we don't really know what that maximum capacity is, and so there's still a ton of potential. And I think, I mean, you talk to growers who have been doing this for a really long time, they have organic matter that is way higher than what most would consider average organic matter in their area. So I think there's potential to build for a long time. And then what kind of soil tests are, are you talking? So we personally are doing bulk density in soil organic carbon. Um, so that accounts for all the carbon that's found in the soil and then the bulk density helps us calculate the stock of that soil carbon. Any more questions, Rana? Back here, I'll give you the microphone. Yeah, so um, what about rented acres versus owned acres? Could you uh, address that? Is that, a, is that uh, difficult to enlist rented acres, or is it the owner that benefits, the operator? Um, so yeah, just make a comment yeah. on that. Yeah, I can definitely make a comment on that. Um, I know it is challenging for the programs that have three, five, ten years that rented land is really not a good fit. Um, with our one-year program, we can include rented acres and make that a possibility for farmers, um, which I think means for those of you who, is, who are picking up land from your neighbor who, you know, beat the heck out of a soil for a long time, I mean, you can benefit from that as long as you can maintain and keep the ground from the landowner. Um, I, uh, in terms of negotiating with the landowner, we don't have a ton of guidance on how that conversation should go because every relationship is different. Uh, I do recommend being up, uh, forthcoming about it and trying to figure out the best way to negotiate that between the two of you, um, especially when you can market it to them that you are adding value to their land by implementing practices that benefit them and their soil. 
Um, that would be probably the language that I would use for the landowner. I was asking about the, uh, if you were going to seed uh, alfalfa establishment, uh, does that qualify them? That is a great question. It depends on the past history of the, the field. Um, perennial crops are harder to, in terms of past history to accounting, but yes, I do believe we can allow um, perennial systems in, uh, in the program. Sort of a similar question: Is this is most of the are most of the signups that you're doing in these first years? Are they mostly row crop farmers? Or oh, okay, so yep. Curious, how does how do how does livestock how do livestock operations fit into that? If somebody makes a change in their a huge change in their farm and they put mm -hmm. additional land into pasture so that the satellite sees green, does that matter? I mean, I think. We're, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, we are currently working with growers to figure out the best solution for that because we do recognize that putting land into pasture um, is definitely something that a lot of growers want to do, especially when you talk about like the five principles of soil health, right? Um, I do think the biggest thing is if you were tilling and using the ground before and you're bringing in carbon now, that's really the framework that we should be thinking about it. Um, another thing we're talking about currently is uh, CRP. Um, we don't have defined metrics around that right now because it is our first year and we're in the middle of those conversations as we speak. Right, there's no additionality. Um, I do want to add one thing that I did not talk about before. Um, there is a company called Farm Raise. Uh, they're pretty awesome, and you should check them out. Um, in terms of carbon programs, you can double up on carbon credit programs and government assistance or other grants with these carbon programs. You can't double up carbon program to par carbon program, so you can't have one credit account for two different programs and get paid for both of them because that's a very big no-no in terms of really screwing up the accounting. But in terms of, of like USDA, Equip, or whatever, go to Farm Raise. They make that process really simple, uh, really quick. And so then, I mean, I've seen numbers as close to $50 an acre <laughs> for doing some of these practices. And so there is definitely opportunity there as well because um, we want you to be able to do these practices and succeed. Okay, I will leave that up there if anybody wants to take a picture of it, um, but I don't see any other questions. All right, thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Thank you.